So, welcome. Welcome to Vintage Game Night. And for tonight, I've decided that I'm actually going to go back and replay Super Metroid, a game I absolutely love. And um, I, I, I've replayed this so many times. Uh, not recently, though, or not too terribly recently. And the reason I wanted to go back and play it is because it is a really fascinatingly well-designed game. And after the other night talking about Dark or going through Dark Souls and talking about the encounter design a little bit, I really wanted to revisit this. And then at the same time, uh, earlier today, H.R. Geiger, the, uh, the painter, artist, and sculptor, uh, he passed away. And um, most people know him as being responsible for the Alien series. And the Alien series uh, had a very heavy influence on the Metroid series. Uh, so it seemed a little bit appropriate. Uh, so I kind of took it as a sign and said, okay, Super Metroid it is. Fortunately, this is a short game. If I do it right, it'll take about three hours, which means two sessions. If I don't do it right, it'll take a little bit longer than that. Uh, and I'm not going to try and 100% it, uh, because I'm actually going to try and move through... I'm ac I actually want to comment on the way the game is designed and put together. And I'm not going to belabor this point. I'm going to get started right away. But I'm not going to speed run it. I'm not going to sequence break it. I'm going to play it in sort of the way it seems to want to be played. The way it was designed. And sort of look at all the various tricks that the game plays so that even though you feel like you're alone through the entire game, at no point are you ever actually really off the rails. And the reason I want to look at that is because there's a lot of great lessons in there um, for role-playing games, uh, which if you're not a role-playing gamer and somehow found my channel anyway, you should know that I am. I frequently run uh, d and uh, every week, um, run a, a gaming-based blog, uh, the angry or angrydm.com. So I'm going to kind of take a look at the game from that perspective. So enough talking. Let's get this started. And there are actually going to be points where I'm going to where I'm going to go just a little bit quiet because the game is also wonderfully atmospheric and I don't want to ruin that. So this game is actually the third game in the Metroid series. Um, the first one, Metroid, was released uh, in Japan on the Famicom in uh, 86, 86. Uh, and in America in, I think it was 87. Um, and it was sort of a, a free-roaming, exploration-based game. This is also, this is the, uh, the Attract Mode video that plays, and I'm just going to let this play because it shows off some of the game. And actually, even this plays some uh, design tricks, too. It shows off a few things that you might never discover in the game. So, uh, the first game, Metroid, uh, involved uh, Samus Aran, a bounty hunter hired by the Galactic Federation uh, to stop the space pirate menace, and more importantly, because the space pirates had managed to get a hold of a scientific specimen, the uh, creature called a Metroid, which had been discovered by scientists on the planet SR-388. It was discovered that Metroids um, were highly dangerous creatures that would reproduce very quickly if exposed to beta radiation. And these space pirates on their base in the planet, or in their base on the planet Zebus, were breeding them so uh, in an attempt to take over the galaxy. Uh, after numerous attempts to stop the space pirates, the Galactic Federation, actually the Galactic Feder Federation Space Police, uh, failed at it, and they hired Samus Aran to go in as a bounty hunter and defeat 
Mother Brain, the leader of the Space Pirates, and then the Menace. And we're going to get started here. The second game, which was a Game Boy exclusive game, which uh, I want to say 1990. Um, in that one, the Galactic Federation had decided after Samus' is successful... Whoops. I forgot how to do the controls. Um, after Samus' successful mission against the Space Pirates, she was sent to the planet SR-388 to eradicate the Metroids once and for all. And the intro to this game kind of picks up the story from there, so I will let it take over. The last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. Hoping all this text is uh, visible on the screen there. Yeah, it looks good. So this actually shows the end of the NES game, the first game where Samus defeats Mother Brain, which was a giant brain in a jar. And this is the end of the Game Boy game. And in fact, at the end of the Game Boy game, it turns out you are actually trapped below the surface, and the Metroid has to help you by devouring some blocks that are in your way to, to rescue you. So the baby Metroid actually had saved Samus's life. So as the game begins, Samus is responding to the distress call at the uh, science research station. Interestingly enough, Ceres is the name of one of the largest asteroids in the solar system asteroid belt. And according to the original Metroid manual, the, uh, the Metroid story actually took place in our universe. Earth was mentioned, and it took place in the year 2000. Samus eradicated the Metroids in the year 2000 and X. Uh, so just a note on the controls, running, uh, aiming in eight different directions, shooting, um, ducking, and other abilities as they come up. This little room here is actually kind of interesting because you notice this little block here that sort of requires you to, to discover the jump button. So the, it's the first thing that Metroid does to kind of uh, make sure that you're picking up the controls, which is something that it does continuously throughout the game. You might recognize this scene from the from the opening, um, with of course the dead scientists to establish some tension. Whoa. So this is Ridley, and the game begins by throwing a boss fight at you. And one of the other neat things that uh, the game does is the way Ridley appears, um, the, with his one eye just kind of visible uh, just above your viewpoint, it's kind of there to prompt you to discover you can point your gun in different directions. 
which is also something that if you paid careful attention you saw in the opening scene when Sam has pointed her gun up at the Metroid as it hatched. So even in that opening cutscene, the game was already trying to teach you the basic controls. Now the truth of the matter, which you don't know when you play this the first time, is that this is actually a highly scripted fight where once Ridley has done enough damage, he will fly away. Uh, though if you do manage to do enough damage to him, he will also fly away. And then somehow Ridley sets the uh, space station to explode. So those little steam vents will knock you back. They won't. They don't actually injure you, um, and they're pretty easy to time pass. But you can also ignore them. Uh, likewise, the panels that fall from the ceiling won't actually hurt you, but they will knock you back. And then this room sort of wow serves as a test to see whether or not you really have figured out how to jump. And I'm doing really awful at it, as it turns out. The time constraint there is nerve-wracking, but it's not awful. Um, you know, it's actually kind of hard to miss that. And now we end up returning to planet Zebus in pursuit of Ridley. Ridley was actually uh, one of two lieutenants in the Space Pirates um, under Mother Brain. He was defeated by Samus in the first game, along with the other lieutenant, Creed. Um, later on in the manga and some of the other games, they sort of established this um, really, quite frankly, unnecessary backstory where Ridley murdered Samus's parents in front of her, and it really was was totally unnecessary. Oh, so this is the surface. Of, I'm just like running a, running ahead into the game. So this is the surface of Zebus, and uh, your ship will serve as a recharge location and also allow you to save your game. Um, you know, this this game was one of the ones with a battery pack by this point, and uh, console games that had become kind of ubiquitous. Uh, the first Metroid game actually used a password system. And as you start out, you're basically on the surface. You know Ridley is here somewhere with the Metroid, and you begin to search. And if you adopt the standard habit in most uh, side-scrolling platformers at the time, you would move to the right and quickly discover this is not a, not a game that lets you move to the right just yet. Kind of gets you into the idea that you're moving in all sorts of different directions, up, down, left, right. So now we start to explore. And the game is really, like here, the, the atmosphere is just wonderful because this whole place is abandoned except for that little vermin. The, the music isn't really even music so much as it's, um as just like ambient noise or sort of halfway between and while we can open that door we can't get to it so it's already starting to tantalize us with places we can't get to this door doesn't respond to our gun this one does but we can't get any further so the game is kind of promising us exploration, but right now it is just not delivering. Right now it's saying, this is the way you have to go. Um, now, folks who had played the original Metroid would recognize this pit as the final sequence in the original Metroid where you have to escape up this vertical column. Uh, actually, there's a bomb about to go off and destroy the Space Pirate's base. And now you can see that it's all destroyed. Uh, the remains of Samus's first mission here. And this, if you played the original Metroid, you recognize as Mother Brain's chamber, or you also might recognize it from that opening sequence. Which is one of the reasons why they showed it to you. This is kind of this is all kind of a neat callback to the first game. So 
So now, by this point, you might have noticed that in the upper right hand corner, we have a map that is slowly filling itself in as we explore the game. And the, the reason I bring that up is because as you take that elevator, it actually transitions you from one place to another. Uh, I'm gonna... This is the first power-up you pick up in the game, the Morphing Ball. Uh, it's in almost exactly the same location it was in the first Metroid game, which again is a neat callback. And then of course you have this effect, and it's like, what is that? It's not hurting you, it's not doing anything, so we're just gonna leave it alone. So the Morphing Ball allows Samus to curl up into a little ball and fit through these narrow passages. Uh, it was an artifact from the first game, and originally the designers in the first Metroid game wanted to make Samus crawl, but they couldn't, they couldn't get the animation quite right, they weren't happy with it, so ultimately they went with the, went with the, um, curling up into a ball thing. But now since we're here, we start to explore a little bit, using our Morph Ball. And you might also be thinking back to those places in the in the in the previous area where I could uh, curl up and roll to new areas. But already the game is giving me another item, and this is the missile. Um, by pressing select, uh, I'm not going to use up the missiles yet because I need them to get in the door. But I'll show you in just a sec. So you press select to switch to your missile, also something that you saw Samus do in the opening scene. And you eventually, I mean, you try it out on these red doors and discover that five missiles open the door. Fortunately, the door makes a noise and responds when you hit it with the first missile, so you know you're actually doing something. The game is actually really good at letting you know when you're doing something. And now we've kind of hit a dead end here. Looking at our map, we've pretty much hit dead ends in this whole area that is apparently called Brin Star. So, with nothing else to do, we'll head back up that elevator to the surface and explore some of those other passages we couldn't get into. And that is ultimately the pattern of Metroid. Very, very much Metroid is exploration based. And the idea is that each discovery that you make rewards you by unlocking new things that you can explore. So exploration is both the goal and sort of the reward. And whoa, now we find out what those strange searchlights were. We have alerted the space pirates and apparently this base isn't as abandoned as we thought it was. These guys are actually space pirates, they are Zabesians. Um, they were in the original game, and they will be sort of, uh, ubiquitous throughout the whole thing. Uh, this passage kind of gets you used to another, um, another string to Metroid's bow, which is backtracking. You're gonna find yourself doing a lot of backtracking in the game, but to their credit, the designers were kind of careful to make sure that even when you were backtracking, it felt fresh. So for instance, going up this passage is very different from going down it. You know, going down it, you're just falling and avoiding the platforms, whereas going up it, you actually have to do the jumps and platform. And also by filling it with enemies, they've, they've added some other differences. Um, and you'll find that they do that in a lot of places where They'll, they'll make passages that you're going to have to go back and forth through feel different one way and another. Or sometimes even force you to go around by a different route. And now, we have possibilities open to us. So we're going to go ahead and check out these doors. And now I know what to do here, but still can't get anywhere. And those blocks are off screen, so I can't hit them with my gun. So I'm just gonna be out of luck this way. But again, that's something that I'm gonna kind of file away in the back of my head and remember for later, if I figure out a way to deal with that.
This game follows, or for the most part, it tries to follow a rule that, um, actually Ron Gilbert put forth. He was talking about adventure game design, and, and one of his sort of commandments of adventure game design. Oh, this is... Not sure what this is, so we walk up to it and discover that it gives us a map of the area. So now we see we're in an area called Criteria. There are those elevators that lead down to somewhere else called Brinstar. And we can see that even though we couldn't head to the right, there's actually a lot more going on to the right than we thought. The map actually is very useful in this game. Um, it, a it actually helps you solve a number of puzzles. Um, so anyway, uh, Ron Gilbert had this rule for adventure game design, and his rule was never show the, never give the the players the key before they find the door. And there's a really good reason for that. It's actually a really good philosophy to follow if you're uh, running role-playing games. And the reason for it is if you show people the key first and they put the key in their pocket, then when they get to the lock, unless it's really, really obviously telegraphed, they tend to forget that they have the key. Whereas if you show them the lock first, you establish in their head that this is something that they want to get past, and they're all they're in they enter sort of in a problem solving mode where now, in the back of their head, they're remembering that lock is there and they're keeping their eye out for something that's gonna get them through it. So by showing us that little narrow passageway with the blocks, um it's kind of said, hey, keep your eye out for something to deal with this. Now we can go down here, and Metroid wants you to go everywhere, so that's what we're going to do. And we're rewarded by finding another door. We also might have noticed it on the map. And one of the other things you might notice on the map is that areas that have uh, dots in them generally have items that you can discover. I don't know why I'm running back and forth farming for health. I don't need it. And by now we know how to deal with the red doors. And this is another of these mysterious statues. These are actually Chozo statues, um, which, which, um, oh, actually, I forgot about this guy. So you head back to the door, and it locks, and it's gray, which means you can't open it, and you're trapped in here until you deal with this. You can shoot him in the abdomen with missiles or or with your gun. And if you need to refill, you can shoot those rocks that he fires off. Whoops. But the other thing that's interesting is that you can't shoot him from ground level. You actually have to either point your gun upward or you have to jump to hit him. So either way, again, the game is saying, hey, have you figured out how to use your mobility or use your aim? to deal with the problem. And then, of course, once you beat a boss, the game hands you a lot of refueling. Anyway, the Chozo statues are statues that were left behind by an ancient galactic civilization. They appeared in the first Metroid game and in the second one. And at this point in the series, they weren't actually very well explained. They were just sort of this mysterious ancient civilization. Um, oh, I forgot. I picked up a new item, which is the bomb. While I'm in a morph ball, I can use the bomb to drop... Uh, I can drop a bomb. It gives me a little bit of an explosion, and it also bounces me upward. Well, since there doesn't seem to be any other way to get out, you then try out your bomb on these blocks. Eventually, I mean, it, you know... It, takes a little while to figure out how to get out of that little trap, but... Um, and that's another thing that Metroid uses as kind of a standard technique for teaching you things, is, um, is trapping you in a place until you find the solution. Uh, so it, it has a tendency to lock doors behind you, 
And now, as we were talking about with the whole key and lock philosophy, now I know I have the key that gets me past these little blocks. So I remember that this place was here, and I come back and check it out. And now at this point, and I'm rewarded with more missiles. So every one of these missile upgrades you find uh, gives you five more missiles, five more maximum missiles. Whoop. Now see, I was holding to the right because I was getting ready to roll as soon as I, as soon as that block exploded, but I actually discovered that there's an invisible passageway because I was rolling up against the wall when it happened. Which, again, is uh, kind of a neat little setup, because it tells you, hey, here's another trick that we do in this game. We're going to make invisible walls. And since your natural inclination at that point is going to be hold to the right, you know, so that you're rolling when that block breaks, you're probably going to discover it just by accident. And then you're going to start to keep an eye out for it. Now, at this point, it looks like we've been everywhere that we can go. Remember, we can't go to the right yet. We might try to bomb through those blocks out outside in Criteria, and I'm going to tell you that you'll discover that you can't get through them with the bombs. But the map also indicates that there's more to the left here. So, we start to play around. And that's what I was talking about with the map sort of helping you solve puzzles. The map actually is a tool. Uh, it's a hint system. And... Uh, in several places, it actually keeps you from getting lost. And now we find our first energy tank, which increases Samus's maximum amount of energy. So, uh, you can see each pink box in the upper left represents uh, 99 health. And now we run into these space pirates that block my lasers. Fortunately, missiles go right through them. They also drop missiles quite frequently to make sure that you have enough missiles to deal with more of them. And then we have two choices here, and this is where the game plays another interesting little psychological trick. As I drop down, I already have my missiles equipped. Um, I notice that the door on the right is red, it's a missile door. And I also notice something strange on the map, that there's nothing beyond it. That's tantalizing enough for me to pick that door first. And it's important that the game does that because this spot at this point is entirely optional. You could walk right past it and not know it was here until much later in the game. So the game plays these little psychological tricks to get you to go this way first so that you see this mysterious statue. Now you might recognize on the top of the statue that's Ridley the Space Dragon. Um, uh, with the glowing red eye. But I don't recognize anything else about the statue. Um, I might discover that the water drastically reduces my mobility. But other than that, there's not really much I can do in here just yet. But I do pay attention to it, and I remember it. It's very distinct. And like I said, even though it's completely optional, because of the mental state that the game puts you in at that point, it's very rare for people to actually walk past it. There's actually a few totally optional pickups in this game that the game is actually really, really good about making sure that you don't miss them or choose not to. Even though at no point does the game tell you, go this way or go that way. This game is actually very lacking in, in on-screen text. It, it tells you nothing. You don't communicate with anyone. Um, it gives you instructions for how to use the different abilities. Uh, you know, when you pick up an item, it says use this button to use the ability. And now we find we're in a new area and running kind of blind on the map, except that we know that this is somehow in the same place as the original Metroid area that we were wandering through. So now, you know, we kind of 
we wandered back and forth through those hallways and criteria and sort of got used to them. They sort of feel a little familiar now. So now by coming down this way, um, we feel a little bit lost again. And the game kind of keeps playing that game of atmosphere where it, you know, once you start to feel comfortable and secure, it goes back to making you feel lost, alone, isolated, and at times even trapped. So now at this point I've become clever enough to not believe a dead end when I see one. Especially because I can kind of see that this wall mysteriously continues on to the edge of the edge of the screen. So we try out our different tools. And we are rewarded for our explanation exploration with the map of Vrinstar. Which is a much bigger area than the one we've been exploring before. So now it says kind of, hey, look at all of this now. Again, you were starting to feel good, you were starting to feel like you were getting things down, and the game immediately says, nah. -uh. Uh, for some reason, a number of the rooms also do that, where the door is locked until you defeat all the enemies in it. Um, sometimes it's to make sure that you figured out something. Sometimes uh, I'm not entirely sure why it's done. Now, I could run off to the right and start exploring in that direction, but I'm paying enough attention to my map to notice that there's a save point here. So I'm going to be a little bit cautious and save before I keep exploring. So again, finding the map rewards you with, with that little, hey, go here first. I also might have noticed that those red guys are invincible. Um, you can fire any weapon you want at them, it's not going to hurt them, and that's going to become important later. So then I come to this room, and this is actually a pretty famous room among Metroid fans. So it's got that floor that collapses as soon as you walk on it. But I can see from the map that the room continues off to the right. And I can get through. But I also see those gates that close as I get close to them. And this is as far as I get. And to be totally honest, this room is a little bit cruel, because you have to figure out how to get through this room. Um, at this point, um, we can continue downward, and we're going to continue downward for a second. Just to see what's in these other rooms, because you get frustrated there and you say, well, I don't know what to do there. So we get into this room with the strange lighting effect, and we notice that every time we kill those pill bugs, um, it gets darker. So we start to think twice about doing it, and the, that game sets up kind of a nasty choice there, because those pill bugs make it difficult to navigate the room, but so does not seeing the floor. So you kind of have to decide. Um, which is, which problem do I want to deal with? Do I want to deal with visibility, or do I want to deal with those bugs? And you can bet your ass we're going to see that, that exact question again and again. Which, of course, is another great lesson for running, uh, running role-playing games, and that is, you know, give the players the opportunity to to decide which of the problems they want to deal with. Basically, meaningful choice is about there being two things that the party wants or two things that the party doesn't want, and they have to choose which ones to deal with. So now at this point, look, obviously that wall was a little weird, so we go through it. Oh, I never got back through that other room. I was wrong. That's not a place I have to get through. 
Let's go back to that other room for a second because I was wrong on that. That's a, an optional direction to go in. Oh, no, no, no. I am right. I cannot get through that room right now. Forget, forget what I said. I was right. I got that confused with another room, which we'll see in a minute. I was going in the right direction. I'm just skipping the part where a new player would would hang out in that room for a little while and discover they don't know how to proceed until ultimately they give up and file it away for later. And again, getting the getting a player to sit sit in that room for a little while and puzzle over it helps them remember it later so that they come back to it. Now obviously I see this floor is weird, so I immediately drop the bombs and discover I can't blow through it, but there is something odd about it. Unfortunately, I have no idea what that symbol means. So, maybe I shoot missiles into it, maybe I shoot my gun at it, but ultimately, I have to move on. So now I have this big vertical room, and I can see it opens up in a couple of different directions. So, looking at my map, I can see that going up sort of leads me to a dead end. And down definitely leads to more progress. So, being a seasoned video gamer, I go up first, figure I'll check out what's here. And then go down afterwards. Now, as we'll see in a little while, if I had gone down first, it wouldn't take me long to run into a dead end. So the game sort of corrals me into going up. Now again, being attentive, I notice this little oddness. And I also notice on the map that there's obviously an open space here. And I am rewarded with a very handy save point. I don't realize it's handy right now, but I will realize it in a minute. And I know I make a lot about how the game sort of corrals you and, and tricks you into going the way it wants to, but I have to emphasize, um, if you've never played the game before, it doesn't feel that way while you're playing it. At, at almost every point, you feel like you're freely exploring, and that every time you make progress, you're being rewarded for your own cleverness. Even though there's a whole... Uh, someone wrote an article about the game, and they actually called it the Invisible Hand of Super Metroid. And they analyzed a lot of the tricks that the designers use to get you to move forward. Uh, get you to move along what I'll call the critical path through the game. I, f I forgot how much of a pain these winged guys are. These are actually, um, they're called Key Hunters. They're uh, winged space pirates. And this is another room where you have to defeat all the enemies before the doors will open. Now, we are trapped because this is the first time we have seen a green door. And while we've kind of figured out that red doors open with missiles and blue doors open with beams, we don't know what opens a green door. This is also uh, probably the least popular boss in this game, or mini boss, I should say. This is Spore Spawn. And what you see is what you get. He pretty much drifts back and forth. He's invincible while he does that. He drops the, the spores that, that um, they'll hurt you, but if you shoot them, they drop health pickups or, or missile ammo. And every so often, he'll open up, oops, and you can take one or two shots, and then... It, it feels like he's got a little bit too much health, to be totally fair, and the, the boss fight has a very slow pace to it. Especially because you get to a point where it's like, okay, I figured out the pattern. Um, just let me go. 
And if I had to critique anything in, in the Metroid series, I would say that some of their boss fights really do tend to overstay their welcome. Like, well past the point where you've proven you know what you're doing, um, and you're not really in any danger. Uh, you're still fighting. Now you can see he's getting getting hurt because he's turning to a darker color, and also he's getting a lot faster. But he can't hit you when you're rolled up into a ball, and if you just even if you just avoid the spores or take the occasional hit from the spores, you're fine. Oh, I was in a good spot there. Uh, is it just me or is the stream getting choppy? Or is that just on my end? Because... Because I'm uploading it. I'm uploading a stream as I'm downloading it. Now I have a chance to experiment with this door and discover that bombs won't open it and gun won't open it, missiles won't open it. So once again I'm trapped and I kind of have to carry on. Fortunately, Spore Spawn has opened a, opened a path. Uh, I'm just going to hit refresh on my stream here just to make sure that things are going okay. All right, hold on one second. All right, that's looking a little bit better. Ah, it... Twitch chose the worst time to decide I have to re-log in to prove that I'm, I don't have to watch their ads. <laughs> Alright, things have calmed down a little bit now. Alright, carrying on. Whoop. Hey! A secret. A long pit. And a new toy. So this is the super missile. It is more powerful than the normal missile. Um, obviously, that's why it's called super. Um, it does a lot more damage, and it also shakes the screen when it impacts. One of the things the game also does um, is periodically in spots where it thinks you might need a little bit of help, it puts these little enemy spawning tubes or sometimes they're lava pits just to kind of make sure that you pick up, just to make sure that you have opportunities to refill yourself. And now we encounter a green door again, and this time we take a guess and discover that sure enough, Super Missiles are the key to the green doors. And now we can proceed. Oh! Now that's interesting. We also discover these blocks that have a symbol that matches the Super Missile. Which teaches us a couple of things. Number one, it teaches us what the symbol for a Super Missile enabled block is. But number two, it teaches us that when we hit use the bombs and expose one of those weird symbols, it's telling us which item to use. 
Now by this point, Super Metroid has trained us to pay very close attention to our surroundings and notice anything odd. So you might notice that there's a lot odd right here. Uh, those two displaced blocks, the way the wall in front of me kind of melts with the floor, and the way that there looks to be like a ceiling underneath me. So all of that kind of draws me here to find this. And this is actually an optional pickup. That is, you do not need it to beat the game. You can go through the whole game without it. Um, but at the same time, the game, if you've been paying attention, the game makes it almost impossible for you to actually miss it. And now, we uh, would move on. But maybe things look odd there, and I bomb there. Now, I'm skipping the part where I sort of bomb everything that looks remotely odd, but you have to imagine that in your first playthrough, that's what you're doing. And now we see a block marked with a symbol I don't recognize yet. But now I can be sort of confident in saying, well, that's probably a tool I don't have yet. And now I come to this spot, where it forces me to use the, the recoil from my bomb to get enough air to get it through. So again, I'm being forced to use that technique. In this case, it's called the bomb jump. And there's a few more places where you kind of have to use it and a few more places where it's helpful. So now I'm descending deeper into the planet. Did I run out of super missiles demonstrating them? Damn it. Okay, so this is actually an interesting one because this one puzzled me for a long time. This is the first time we run into one of these weird gates. And you notice the blue light on there. And we've come to associate blue things with our beam, just like red things with our missile and green things with the super missile. But as I was doing it, I sort of puzzled over, what is this wall here for? This little wall that you have to jump over. And I realized what it was there for is because as I'm coming here, I might be shooting at this guy. And if I hit that gate just before it comes on screen and manage to activate it, I will not see that my beam opened a gate and I might not figure it out. So they put that wall there to keep a stray shot from opening the beam before I could see what, or opening the door before I could see what opened that door. I don't know whether that was a matter of playtesting or whether it was just careful observation, but either way, again, it just shows the, the level of design work that they put into this whole game. And now I can't proceed this way. And this is the room that I was actually referring to before that I got the other room confused with. Because the floor collapses out from under me. And I have to proceed. This is the only way to go forward now open to me. And what the game is doing here is making sure that I have discovered that I have a run button on my controller. Where if I hold it down, I will move faster. I'm going to need that in a minute, and the game wants to make sure that I know that it's there. Until I figure that out, I'm trapped in this room because the door behind me turned gray. So you're actually locked into that room until you get through it. Now here's a tantalizing ledge, and I can see the shaft goes up further, but I can't quite make that jump, however hard I try. So I'm going to have to settle for going down, but at least I know that there's more in the downward direction. Hmm. Alright, so... An orange door, which I haven't seen before, and that strange symbol again. And this... Whoops. And this block over here and this block down here. And this is actually the way to proceed. Now I bombed it because I was checking out that area, which appeared to be a dead end. And now I discover something very unpleasant. I am trapped down here. These little beetle guys are invincible. I can't kill them. And there is no way I can jump back. I have just managed to get myself trapped at the bottom of this pit. 
And the next part of this game, uh, actually, you'll now spend the next good while in this game trying to untrap yourself from this pit. Because you can't go back the way you did. And there's a very important reason for that. Which is going to become obvious... Well, it'll become obvious when I point it out. <laughs> now here, if I didn't run into the water in the statue room, this is the first time that I'm going to deal with water. And discover that water ruins my jumping ability and my movement ability. But if I stand just there, I can still make the jump and carry forward. This little room is just there to make sure that I know what water is and what it does. Whoa, and I fell into the water here and got caught underneath that ledge. Now I might also notice that odd block there and discover that I can jump up, but I can't go any further just yet. So again, we'll file that away for future reference. And if I'm really attentive, I notice that the floor of the room above me looks like the other rooms that had those statues in them, and those always have items. So now, I really want to figure out how to get up there. Now that's three times in a row the game has thrown at me a jump too high for me to get, get up to. So it's kind of, like, taunting me with that. The other interesting trick this does is, if I'm paying attention to the map at this point, I will notice that I just transitioned into a new area. This area called Meridia. And I'm going through this underwater tube, like a, like a, like at an aquarium. I can't go anywhere from there yet, but there's sort of this tantalizing mystery that's established about you know, what is Meridia? And until the game shows me Meridia, I know that there's a lot more left to explore. You know, it's like, and then there's Meridia. What could that be? Now, I might just go down this elevator or I might be paying attention to my map again and notice the very obvious appearance of a room beyond this one. So, at this point, I do what I've been taught to do. Play with my bombs and think, oh, I know what those are. Those are super missile blocks. And I can get into this new room. Which doesn't seem very exciting. Whoops, and I had my super missile still on. But I can catch just a glimpse of that weird statue. And see that there's a whole area beyond that statue. With a strange symbol in it. But I just can't make that jump. So that is area number four that I just can't manage to jump up to. One, two, three, four, all in a sequence. So by this point, I'm getting a little frustrated with Samus's jump height. <laughs> and again, it is really important that the game is doing that because it, it wants me to remember that I can't make the, all these jumps. And now I'm in a new area. And again, nothing is explored, and I'm trapped. I can't get up to my ship or back to any of the areas I'm familiar with. So this is pretty much what I would call the loneliest part in the game. Because I'm, I'm trapped and I'm alone. Whoop, and I can't even proceed any further. But, well, the game taught me about that run button, so we try that, right? And I can just make it, but can't make it past that second one. And now, <laughs> with my running, I've gotten myself really trapped. So now, in a little bit of a panic, I start hoping for a way out, dropping bombs all over the floor, and find it. But I can't go any further. But that little moment there, where you become momentarily trapped and can't see an immediate way out, also sticks itself in your mind. It's, it's sort of like a, a panic moment, and you'll remember that in a little while. 
Now this area, as soon as I step in, I notice that I can't seem to go anywhere, and also that my health is draining rapidly, and that I shouldn't be staying in here. I took uh, 150 points of damage there. And that is kind of the gimmick to Norfair. A lot of the areas are super heated, and I can't stay in them, um, or I will cook to death. I encounter another one of those orange doors, and there's nothing I can do to get through that. Again, I try missiles, I try bombs, it doesn't get me anywhere. So we continue to explore. Systematically just checking every door. And here I find an energy tank. But I also notice that that little zoomer is crawling off screen in the lower left. In fact, he's kind of frozen there as I grab the energy tank if I move quick enough. And I also notice I'm trapped because, again, the door has sealed behind me. So, checking out the area, I eventually stumble on those collapsing blocks and can explore this area beyond. But, again, can't jump out. So I have to move on. And now I find an item. Now, interestingly enough, again, you might notice that I kind of carelessly let myself get baited into a trap. Fortunately, these are the high jump boots, which expand your height, the, your jump height. And you will notice immediately what they do because you have to use them to get out of this room. More to the point, Suddenly, what comes flooding back to you are one, two, three, maybe four jumps that you couldn't make. And that's sort of, I mean, that really is the essence of exploration gameplay in the Metroid series. Every item feels like it opens new possibilities, because your mind immediately starts to go back to previous areas and say, now I can go here, now I can go here. And more to the point, you kind of want to go back to everywhere you've been. You want to go back to everywhere you've been and see, well, where can I get now? Can I get this place? Can I get that place? And that's why it's very important that we are trapped down here. Because if we had the entirety of this game to wander back to, all the way back to our ship, um, we would just be overwhelmed. Our attention is right now focused on everything after that shaft that we dropped down because we still can't get back up that way. But before we start backtracking, we'll continue to explore this area because it's convenient and we're here. Though you might not do that, you might actually just get excited and immediately go back to those other areas. So I discover these guys who latch on and start sucking my energy and they are only vulnerable to the bomb. But I also discover these blocks have that mysterious chevron symbol again, and I don't know how to deal with that one yet. So I'm kind of forced to go backwards. I'm taking, I'm taking a lot of hits just demonstrating this game, huh? And now, of course, we're suspicious of that floor because it looks suspicious. And we've been trained to bomb everything that looks suspicious. And we find ourselves in another superheated room on the wrong side of a green gate. And we're going to get the hell out of there before we die. And now, even though there's this entire new area that is unmapped for us to explore, we see it for what it is. A pair of high jump boots and a whole bunch of dead ends. Which is good, because that frees us up to go back to all of those places. You know what it is? It's my virus scanner keeps turning on. And has my mouse cursor been sitting there the whole time? Sorry about that. Apparently, the, the virus scanner doesn't realize that this that the computer is active if this program is running the, the emulator. So now with the high jump boots, let's start going back through those areas. And we'll start with 
the biggest, the most obvious, and the most intriguing, this bizarre statue. Uh, which, by the way, you can kind of see right there that when the design team said they were inspired by H.R. Geiger's work, they weren't kidding. I'm going to take some time to kill these enemies a bit, and because uh, I'm running a little low on health. Wow. It was really finicky as to getting the bomb in just the right spot, huh? A gray door that I can't quite go in yet. And again, seeing that there is more map stretching out to the right, I'm inclined to explore and bomb. And I might notice this odd looking crevice in the ground. I'm having trouble getting my bombs on, on the mark. But I also notice off to the right, there is a save point, and that this room appears to continue to the right. So, we play with our bombs a little bit, and it's almost impossible to miss. And at this point, I'd like to point out again that all of these habits and ideas that the game has taught you to execute, that you're now, you know, kind of recognizing that the map is leaving this place open and that maybe you should try your bombs here. Um, all of this has been done without any on-screen text at all. Without any tutorial. We didn't even really talk about the map or, or the, the manual or the controls. And this was something that, um, I think Yoshio Sakamoto gave a, he was the, the producer of Super Metroid. And he gave an interview, um, back in, you know what, this area is a little bit, um, atmospheric to be talking about Yoshio Sakamoto's interviews. I came in here a little low on health, but fortunately my missiles kind of helped out there, huh? So, um, if you had played the first Metroid, you would have recognized that fat big guy as Creed, the boss of the, uh, one of the mini bosses of the first Metroid game. But if you hadn't, um, he would just be a big pain in the ass enemy to get past. And a few missiles later, you're through. Yeah, and I, I know I'm refilling my health here. Which again, um, because I feel like I just beat a pretty, pretty tough fight. Though actually, if my instinct is to explore rather than refill all my resources... I discover that there is both an energy recharge and a missile recharge. And oh, that makes sense. I just beat a tough fight, so of course the game is going to refill me so I can carry on to the next challenge. But you'll notice that there's... that the tense dramatic music is still there. It has not gone away. And then you see this corpse. Um, probably one of the Galactic Federation people on the first mission to wipe out the space pirates. The corpse is never actually explained, come to think of it. And I think it's the only one you encounter in the game. You also run into the first of those eye doors, and you don't recognize the significance of it just yet because it's the first one that you've run into. And now we find ourselves trapped on the edge of a spike pit. And before we can start to panic... We face someone who, at the time, was one of the biggest enemies ever in a video- ever in a Super Nintendo game. This is Kraid. 
And his gimmick is that you have to fire into his open mouth. But in order to get him to open his mouth, you have to shoot him in the face. And once you've substantially hurt him, then he comes out of the floor completely and re realize, uh, reveals how tall he really is. So he has those little claw talon things that he launches around the room. And also those, uh, the big spiky things that come out of his stomach. He's actually a bit of a tense fight. He's tough to talk about while you're trying to beat him. Because the, the timing in the hitbox to actually damage him is kind of small. Yeah, it's pretty tight. I actually keep hitting him in the nose. Especially because he puts his hand up to block it. I should be using my super missiles. He actually takes far more damage from the super missiles. And if you start to run low on health, um, you can shoot his little flying talon things. And there we go. And that is the first real boss of the game. Now, if you are really attentive and remember it really closely, you might recognize him as part of that golden statue. If you don't, that's okay. But you might, and you might file that away for future reference. And now you get an interesting, interesting ability, and I'm going to talk about the various suit. Um, in a little bit more detail, but for now, I just want to point out that it changes your sprite, and it gives you that sort of flash of light, that sort of level up sort of a thing, even though it's not really a level up so much as just a change in your armor, but that, that um, moment is a very important sort of victory moment. It's like, Okay, you beat... That was a f your first real test. You beat your first real boss. And you'll understand what that means as you start to fight more of the bosses in the game. But everything until now has been a mini-boss or just a normal monster. So it's kind of commemorating that moment because... Whoops, I got caught up there. By changing your sprite by giving you a different color, giving you a different appearance, and giving you that sort of level up victory explosion. It's the only item in the, or actually there's one other item in the game that has that sort of drastic uh, change to Samus. And that's really important. It, it drives it home because at this point in the game, you needed a victory. You needed to feel like, hey, I just won something big. Now what the Varia suit does is it reduces the amount of am damage that you take from enemies. And it also protects you from extreme temperatures. Which means you can now go back down to Norfair and start exploring those superheated rooms. And that's where the game wants you to go. But at the same time... Whoops. And by the way, that little guy, that was a mini crate, or that was mini crate, that was a little tiny clone of crate, meant to kind of trick you into thinking that you just had a big fight, but you didn't. Oops, I was facing in the wrong direction, I didn't even notice it. Now, your instinct at this point might be to to go back down to Norfair, or it might be to go back to some of those jumps that you couldn't make before, because you still have that high jump boot. We also notice that this one, this door now lets us in. We also notice on the map that this room has a dot in it, 
that indicates that something is hidden. So we start bombing and shooting around until we discover the energy tank. Or we get frustrated and miss it, but the energy tanks are optional. So, again, they're just a reward for being really attentive. And that's another thing, is that, like, every reward in this game, every time you, you have a victory, it somehow empowers you. Which is another great, great way to encourage behavior that you want people to take to, to, uh, engage in. So, like, this game wants to encourage you to explore. So every time you explore, every time you search around, every time you do something like that, you're rewarded with something that somehow empowers you. Even if it's just a little bit of extra ammo or a little bit of extra health, it, you, you are better equipped to handle the game the more you explore it. And again, great advice for dungeon mastering is figure out those behaviors you want to be a part of your game and find ways to bring those to empowerment or have those lead to empowerment. Now, with the high jump boots, I can jump back up here in that place that I discovered before and get to this room that I thought looked like an item room. And it actually is. And I'm rewarded with another item. In this case, the Spazer. Which, again, is an optional item. You don't ever have to find this one. You don't ever have to beat the game. And this one's a little easier to miss. You had to be really attention attentive to notice that block in the ceiling. But if you did, you notice that you have a wider beam uh, that does a little bit more damage, uh, you know, because it fires the three beams. And also it works with the charge beam that we had picked up. Now let's pretend at this point that I'm being really stubborn and saying I don't want to go back down to the hot lava land just yet. I have the, the high jump boots. I'm going back to the old world. Basically, the all the areas that I had gotten to because now I want to use my new tools to see what I can discover. And I discover that, oh yeah, I'm still trapped. I am still stuck down in the bowels of this planet and there is nowhere for me to go but onward. And I'm still denied the ability to use my new tools to explore the old areas. I'm also denied the ability to uh, get past this jump. Huh. So again, the game is trying to keep my attention focused on where it wants me to go. And if I try to stray from that, I find that I don't get too far before I have to turn around. It's funny because what this game really manages is the feeling of constantly being one wrong turn from being lost. And sometimes you do. Sometimes you do feel lost in this game. But eventually you'll kind of blunder into the next path because really there's nowhere else for you to go. Even though it feels like you have the freedom to go anywhere. Like, even now, now I have the freedom to explore all those superheated areas. But that really comes down to just two. I still can't get any further in that yellow door. I don't know how to go any further. And the passage to my right just leads to those mysterious chevron-marked blocks. So I can't go that way. And even though I am protected from heat in here, and I'm not taking continuous damage, I have no way to open the gate from this side because I can't hit the gate with a super missile. I can't hit the sensor. So my options are still kind of limited, though I'm going to hit the save point before I continue them. Uh, continue.
The Spazer is a very satisfying beam, by the way. It's it's hard to tell from watching it, but it's got this really satisfying impact to it, and it feels more powerful. It does a lot of damage. It's definitely kind of rewarding to have picked up. Now I can explore this area a bit, because I'm kind of forced to at this point. Because in this area, I also don't have a map anymore. I haven't found the map of Norfair yet. So I really am sort of on my own again. And at the back of my mind, I still have to remember that I am trapped and far from my ship and far from safety. In fact, at this point, I might even have lost sight of the goal of the game, which is, of course, hunting down Rid Ridley with the infant Metroid so that he can't breed it into a super weapon to take over the galaxy. If I'm familiar with... Hey, D12, how are you tonight? So again, I'm presented with invincible enemies. Which is another trick that the game likes to do. Generally, it starts throwing invincible enemies at you around the time that it's going to give you a new weapon or tool. Which it is doing constantly. Though actually in this... Um, I'm a little removed from the new weapon or tool. And those stupid seahorses are a pain in the ass. And now I'm in the bubbles room. Which I call because of the bubbles. Wow, I... Sorry, again, just habit takes over and I immediately make a beeline for the save points. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We are analyzing the design of uh, Super Metroid. Uh, basically picking it apart to see how the designers lead you by the nose through every part in this game and... Uh, see what it teaches you about designing your own areas and your own games, uh, particularly for D&D. So this big open area doesn't seem to really get me anywhere. Um, this is the obvious thing to check out, but we're going to assume I'm a little bit more thorough and checked out the less obvious area over here first. Only because I, I know that there's a little optional pickup over here. Which again, completely optional. You can bypass this one. But it just gives you a few more missiles to deal with. Did the stream freeze up? I just realized part of why the game was looking so laggy on my side was because I was playing the game in my streaming software rather than having my emulator screen front and center. <laughs> That's a little embarrassing. I don't know how long I've been doing that. So... It's kind of even odds as to which door you explore first, and I actually think I chose the wrong one, but whatever. <laughs> Because at this point, now I had two different directions I could have gone in. This room is one of those handy little recharge places where uh, you can just kill the enemies as they come out for power-ups. And the game places them at really good intervals because it's just about when you're starting to get fatigued, when you're, when you're starting to um, get a little drained from dealing with its challenges. And wow, it is throwing a lot of new enemies at me. And you know what? The interesting thing I realized is that I haven't really commented on the enemies very much at all in this game. Because the enemies themselves are sort of secondary to the game. Um, really, most of the game is about exploration. And that's 
really much of the challenge of the game is just traversing the game world. You run into the enemies, you deal with them. None of them are particularly difficult on their own, or at best, uh, you know, they kind of have a limited verb set. Uh, I don't know where I picked up that term. Someone I've been talking to keeps using that for for uh, game analysis, talking about verb sets. Anyway, the enemies don't do a lot of, like, really interesting things. Like, these guys just, they hang out on the wall and they spit fire at you. So you just get past them. This, however, introduces a new and interesting little enemy, this little floating platform guy. If you want to proceed any further in this room, you actually jump on the little floating platform guy. And then the little piston trap, and then another little floating platform guy, who gradually sinks as you ride him. And then you fall in the lava. And at this point, we're just kind of following the path that the game has put in front of me. Um, I had two doors I could have chosen from. I chose this one, the bottom one first. And we're just kind of wandering around. You know, you're sort of, at this point, you're in, you're in an exploration mode where it's, well, let's just see where this gets us. And just keeping an eye out for anything interesting or unusual, like these little platforms that actually don't get you anywhere. But at least you saw them. <laughs> And I, I admit I am purposely wandering in a few spots that I know are sort of dead-end spots. Um, just to kind of emulate that, again, the feeling of this is how the game plays out if you're just kind of playing it for the first time. This is how it was designed to be dealt with. Because now we notice that I'm in the top part of that room, rather than the bottom, and maybe I can get over to that door. And maybe I can miss... Damn it! I missed that jump. That one's a little bit of a pain in the ass. There's actually one little platforming section much later on in the game that um, always gives me enough trouble that it is probably going to be be a spot where I end up save stating just to avoid having to keep walking back to it again and again. This is not it, but once again, I'm I'm very much a purist when it comes to gaming, as as you know, like I don't even want to know that anything about what's coming in Dark Souls. Um and I really don't like using save states unless I absolutely have to. So again, rewarded for traversing that little platforming challenge with missiles, and then... Well, and then I'm kind of stuck. And I see those little blocks with the Phillips head screw pattern in the ceiling. And I might have seen them in a few places before. But they didn't really mean anything to me, and they still don't. But I'm starting to kind of notice them now. If I fall down there, fortunately, in the middle of that area, you can drop through the floor and get out. So, I've done all that I can do in this room, but I'm going to remember... Maybe I'll remember those screw blocks, uh, the, the Phillips head blocks, the plus blocks. Maybe I won't. But, as we've picked up by now, the game does not just let you see something once. And that's actually... Repetition is a skill that very few DMs use. They very rarely use the ability to um, let players figure out how to deal with a challenge and then present it in a variety of different ways. Uh, like, for example, um, imagine... Well, I, now I might recognize that I'm in the top of that bubble room, by the way, but I can get up to this door in the upper right. Imagine trying to build an entire dungeon, uh, maybe a 10-encounter dungeon, a standard 4E dungeon, with just 
three different elements, like maybe two different types of monsters and one different type of trap. And how many different ways can you arrange those things in different rooms to make every encounter feel different? And how would you put that together? In the meanwhile, uh, back to Super Metroid here, I noticed that the map sort of implies that this room continues up above me. So I'm kind of... Because again, the map is constantly helping me solve puzzles. So I test the ceiling and discover a way up and a way forward. Whoops. Collapsing floor. I gotta go out of the room to reset it. But by now, I am an expert at this. I know how to deal with this. That's why the good lord gave me a run button. And by the good lord, I mean Yoshio Sakamoto, the producer of the game. So with the run button, I can run all the way through safely and get to the end. And I'm rewarded with a chevron. And even before I pick up the object, I have no idea what it might be at this point. I'm already thinking back to those chevron blocks that were in my way in like two or three places in the game so far. And I discover that it's the speed booster. And then I think back to other places where more speed would have been helpful. But I don't have time to think because the lava is rising. So I am immediately forced to check out my new speed booster. And discover it is awesome. But see, already now my mind is going back and saying, well, where, where could I have used more speed? Well, obviously, there's those chevron blocks back at the beginning of Norfair. And also, wasn't there that spot where I got stuck between those two gates? Hmm. I should check that out. But before I do that... Before I do that... I remember that at the bottom of this room, I was forced to choose between two different doors, and I went down. So because we are being thorough in our exploration, because every time we're thorough, we get rewarded. And by the way, that is another great trick uh, as a DM, is when the player... I think I mentioned that already. When the players do things that you you want them to do when, you, when they are important... When they do something in the game that you want to emphasize, reward them for it. Um, if they find a, a room that's off the beaten path, make sure there's a treasure or something in it to make it worth it. Not every time. I mean, that's... Hmm, that's another... Oop, a gate we can't get to. So we're turned aside that way. Um, it's another interesting uh, thing on... I, this sort of, I guess, conditioning the whole Skinner box thing. Because people respond best to rewards when they don't know when they're going to happen. So, like, if you reward players for a certain behavior every time they do it, then they're actually less likely to keep doing that behavior than if you only reward them once in a while and they don't know when the reward is coming. Now, I see the chevrons on those blocks and actually discover that, oh, hey, that's that spot that I ran into in the other direction before. So that's a shortcut back to the entrance to Norfair here. And since I am conveniently here, maybe I remember that spot where I got stuck between the two gates. Um where I wasn't quite fast enough to make it through that second gate and got trapped. And that's why it's important that the game made that a trap, where it made you feel for a moment nervous like you were stuck. Now here on the other side, I find these blocks. I still don't know what to do with them. So we're just going to ignore them and check out what's beyond this door. I was going to say another little platforming challenge, but what's interesting and what I never really paid attention to is 
the lava does so little damage that it's actually not even worth doing the platforming challenge. Paying attention over on the right, I can see that there is a small passage. And since I want to be thorough, before I leave this room, I'm going to see if there's anything interesting in there. Because at this point, I check everything. Because the game has taught me that when I am attentive and thorough, I will be rewarded. Now this uh, power-up is actually not optional. You have to get this one. Even though it looked like it was a little reward for being attentive, and you think when you get it, oh, see, I was paying attention and I got something cool. The truth of the matter is the game has made it hard to miss, and you won't get much farther until you pick it up. In fact, you won't even get out of this area. So this is the Ice Beam. And the Ice Beam upgrades both my Spazer and my Charge Beam, so those are both still in effect. But it also gives my Beam the power to freeze enemies, making them harmless and paralyzing them in place for a few moments. I can also kill lesser enemies with the, with the Ice Beam, uh, which means I have to give them two shots, one to freeze them and one to move on, uh, one to kill them. But, um, invincible enemies I can freeze even if they're invincible. Now here I can see that there's a gap in the wall there, but I can't jump up to it in my ball form. But we've got these little bouncing guys that I completely missed. And it teaches you to use the enemies as platforms. And here's another situation where I can use the enemy as a platform. Even though that little invincible beetle is, or that little beetle is completely invincible, I can use the invincible beetles as platforms. And suddenly, I am reminded of a pit that I have been trapped at the bottom of for quite some time now where the only way up was a shaft filled with invincible beetles. And I could keep wandering around and trying to explore at this point, but I'll find that I've pretty much tapped out my options here for now. So eventually, I remember that I have been trapped down at the bottom of Brinstar um, for quite some time. And now I have the tools I need the high jump boots and the ice beam to get out of them, get out of here. And so in a sense, this sort of closes another act in the game where I basically, I was trapped. I was imprisoned in this area, forced to power myself up to the point where I could get out. Still can't quite move in the, lo in the water. And when you get back to that shaft, like the first time you play this game, it really does feel, um, it, it, there really is this sense of relief here. Because all you've been thinking about this whole time is you keep finding these awesome tools and you can't get back to the earlier places in the game and you know that there are things hidden there that you could uncover with all of these new tools that you keep finding. But you've been denied that. So, we can head back. But then, before we head back, we remember there was this jump and we couldn't get out of it before. So hey, before we leave this room, let's just see what's up here. Oh look, more invincible beetle platforms. Which are actually kind of tricky to hit. So let's see what's this way. You know, before we head back the way we came. 
And honestly, I'm being a little bit facetious because once again, if I try to head back the other way, I'll find that I'm in that room where I have to run really fast, but that coming from this direction, I can't do it. And that really, again, this is my only option. Uh, except for the falling in the, the teethy flower parts, that's not my only option. And now the door closes behind me, and it's yellow. And I still don't know how to deal with a yellow door. But I do know how to deal with a green door. <laughs> <laughs> 